All right, so of course we're going through the book of De Deuteronomy. We're in Deuteronomy chapter 13. And, uh, you know, this is one of the uh, more, uh, you know, I guess one of the more well-known, thank you, one of the more well-known passages of Scripture. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's also one that's probably not very popular. It's one that's, uh, uh, you know, maybe a lot of pastors aren't going to turn there and want to expound this book, you know, especially in the day and age that we're living in. Because of the fact that a, a chapter like that could get you in a little bit of hot water. And you say, well, do you really believe that? Do you really believe that we should be, uh, you know, keeping the, uh, the commandments of God, uh, such as Deuteronomy chapter 13? Well, amen. The Bible says, all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished, uh, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. He didn't say, uh, well, except for the old stuff, except for those passages that kind of, you know, rub the fur the wrong way. Uh, no, he said it's all profitable. And, you know, there'd be a lot of profit today if, if we actually uh, practice some of these things. Or, you know, mankind would profit from uh, carrying out laws that are given, such as Deuteronomy 13. I mean, are there not false prophets in our land today? Are they not everywhere? Are they not preaching false gospels and, and drawing people away after false gods? On every, and it, it's, it abounds in our country. <clears throat> They're everywhere. Now, here's the thing. If we actually enacted laws like this, we probably wouldn't have to do it that often. You know, the false prophets would probably say, hey, you know, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. I saw what happened to that last false prophet. You know, I preached about it a few weeks ago, you know, where it says in Ecclesiastes, because, uh, because, uh, um, because um, judgment is not speedily uh, carried out, the hearts of the sons of men are fully set in them to do evil. When, when God's law is not being upheld, when these laws are not being enforced, then the wicked say, let's prosper. You know, what's the worst that could come of this? You know, and especially when it comes to this, you know, uh, this specifically about false prophets. You know, they, they make a lot of profit being a false prophet. You know, there's a lot of false prophets out there that are millionaires making a lot of money fleecing the flock and preaching lies and damnable heresies. So this is a good law. This is, this is a whole, this is just, this is right. Now, it's, we're going to dive it into here. It says there in verse 1, If there arise among you a, a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So this is interesting here because the, what it's showing us is that you know, the purpose of a false prophet is to prove God's people. Okay? The, the purpose of a false prophet is to prove us. Got a lot of P's in there, right? And how's that for an alliteration? But that's the truth, isn't it? Is that what he's saying there? He's saying, look, he, if they arise among you, he says, why is that? Verse 3, the, that the Lord your God proveth you. That's why he's there. That's why God allows that to happen. Now, let's clarify this by saying that, you know, the false prophet arises out of his own accord. You know, the Lord does not, and the Lord allows such people to exist. It's not that God is raising up false prophets and sending them to the people. God doesn't even have to do that. False prophets will come up out of their own accord. They'll love the, the wages of unrighteousness. They'll be motivated by greed and envy and power and covetousness. That they'll, they'll want these things for themselves. That God doesn't even have to raise them up. It just happens naturally. Right. So it's not that God's raising them up and then, and then sending them to see. Saying, look, because what does it say? If there rise a, among you a prophet. No, not when. I mean, they surely will come, right? But here's the thing. Like I said just a minute ago, if we actually carried this out, it'd be more of an if. Than a, than a when. You see what I'm saying? If there, if there arise a false prophet. It's not when God creates a false prophet and sends him to you to see what you're, what you're made of. So, because here's the thing, if you would turn over to James chapter 1, a very familiar passage and a very familiar scripture, I'm sure. But God does not tempt man with evil. We know that from James chapter 1. <coughs> he doesn't tempt man with evil, but he does allow man to be tempted by evil. I mean, that's obvious. God allows, you know, temptations into our life. God allows false prophets to, to cross our paths. God allows bad, uh, wicked things to exist. For, to what end and to what purpose? To prove his own people. To prove whether or not we really love God. To prove, you know, really to give us an opportunity to show how much that we love God. And to express our faithfulness to him. It says there in James chapter 1, verse 13, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. 
But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So what is it that tempts man? It's what comes with from within. These are the things that defile man. These are the things that, that tempt us, the things that come from within us. Of course, we understand, you know, there's also external temptations such as this false prophet. But the false prophet only exists because of the wickedness that's in his heart. It's not because God is, you know, raising up these people and sending them our way. And, you know, here's the thing. The same type of people, they arise among us today, even still. We still have, we have, still have plenty of false prophets. And it's also to the same purpose. It's still so that God can test us and prove us. And that can, often it's so God can, you know, purge his church, can purge his house to clean house. You know, we've had experience with this in Faithful Word where, where people come in, they start preaching damnable heresies. They start denying the Trinity. Why does God allow that kind of thing to happen? Well, God allows that kind of thing to happen maybe so that he can get some of the, the riffraff out yeah. and let him take them away, you know, let them be carried away uh, with these false prophets. So the same type of people, they arise among us today and to the same purpose. Go ahead and turn over to Jude chapter 1. And we need to really let this sink in that there are false prophets among us today, that there will be even false prophets even in our own local church. You know, we've seen that uh, more than once in Faithful Word as we've grown and gotten bigger as the congregation gets bigger. You know, we've seen people creep in. We've seen false prophets arise. You know, not in our own church, even not just in our own church, but elsewhere, you know, and, and there's many examples that we could cite. But these same type of people, they arise even today, even as back then in the, when, when Deuteronomy was written. The Bible says, you're going to Jude, but it says in 2 Corinthians 11, what Paul was, was, was uh, you know, uh, uh, speaking of the things that he's suffered, you know, to, and he says in verse 13, or excuse me, verse 26, in journeyings often in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren. So in Paul's day, again, we see false prophets even then as well. And Galatians 2 would be another one where we could turn to and look at, but we're not going to, where he talks about that there were some that were, uh, that they, let me, let me just read it. He said, uh, uh, I went up by revelation and communicated unto them the gospel that I preached unto the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I had run or had run in vain, but neither Titus who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in. Now what I want you to notice there is he says that it was false brethren unawares brought in. You know, that's how these people come in. They come in unawares. They creep in. Look here in uh, Jude chapter 1 verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God in lasciviousness and denying the own Lord God uh, and, and our Lord Jesus Christ. So one of the trademarks or one of the hallmarks of one of these things these false prophets like to do is like to turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. And, you know, that's what we see a lot of today in our ecumenical movements, in these, in these uh, you know, neo-evangelical churches where every, just everything's under grace. Live however you want. God's not mad at you. You know, you're going to be fine. You know, you're, you're free to sin. And, you know, you, I'm glad the Holy Spirit's convicted you of that, but he hasn't me. You know, therefore, it's not sin. It's a, bunch of non, it's a bunch of nonsense. And what they're doing is they're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. They're saying, oh, because you're saved, you know, you can do whatever you want. And we understand we can do whatever you want and go to heaven. But what they're preaching is, oh, you can do whatever you want. And there's no consequences. That God, somehow God is just going to not, you know, he's going to turn a blind eye to his own people living in sin. And that's really a whole other sermon. But what I really want us to notice there is that it says that these men were crept in unawares. And even in Galatians, he said the brethren were unaware, a false brethren unawares were brought in. Meaning it wasn't obvious. It wasn't, they, they could not, you couldn't say, oh, this person's a false prophet. This perfect person is a reprobate. <coughs> so the motive is always the same. It's denying the Lord God. It's preaching, you know, lasciviousness. But they creep in un unawares. And what that means to us today is, is that we, you won't know who it is. You know, who's the false prophet? Well, you won't know. There's no, you know, there's no point in, in, in trying to figure that out because it says they're crept in unawares. And if you would, turn over to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. So what that means is that if you have a, if you have a suspicion about somebody, you know, you got a hunch about a specific person, you might as well just cross them off your list because they're crept in unawares. 
I mean, if you, you know, if we think, oh, it's this person, what's well, like, well, then no, it can't be because, because then it's not unawares. You see what I'm saying? And, you know, here's the thing. I've suspected people of being a Judas. I'll be perfectly honest. Let me just be completely candid up here. You know, I've, I've met people at Faithful Word and been like, this guy is probably a Judas. <laughs> Don't come up to the service and ask me if it was you, okay? <laughs> All right, that's just going to be awkward. Right, but I, I'll be honest, you know, I, I wasn't like, and I wasn't because I had any evidence. It wasn't any because I had, you know, it was just a hunch. You know, I didn't like the, I didn't like the guy for some reason. You know, you know, uh, you know newsflash, there's some people I don't like. <laughs> They wouldn't know it, though, because I always manage to smile and be polite. But here's the thing, you know, I'm thinking, you're a Judas. I can just, you know, how you doing, Judas, you know? I'm just waiting, you know, there's a little clock starts running over their head, just a, a timer, you know, like a ticking time bomb. And you know what? I've been proven wrong about every one of those people. <laughs> Not one of them has turned out to be a Judas. And the people that I said, there's no way this guy's a Judas, they turned out to be the Judases. The people that crept in unawares, the people that were my buddies, the people that, you know, even to this day, send me random texts, you know, and wish me Merry Christmas. It's like, what in the world? Anyway, I don't want to go off on that. <laughs> you know, they turned out to be the, the, the phonies and the, and the backstabbers and the Judases and the false prophets and all these things. It wasn't the guy I thought. Why? Because they creep in unawares. Because the devil is subtle. If it was that obvious, it wouldn't work. Okay? And... <laughs> I mean, look here in John chapter 13. We've got to get this through our heads and understand this because this is, you know, God puts this in the Bible for reason to show us something. That even the disciples gave Judas a pass. And it wasn't just because they, you know, there was, no, there was no reason to suspect Judas. I mean, Jesus without, I mean, not in so many words, but pretty much just said, hey, it's Judas. Yeah. That Judas is the one. And they're all like, oh, it couldn't be Judas. But it was, and he even said it was. He gave him a pass even after Jesus made it clear that it was Judas. Look at John chapter 13, verse 21. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto, one of you, unto you, that one of you shall uh, betray me. Then the disciples uh, looked one to another, doubting of whom he spake. You know, is it I, Lord? You know, they start looking around. Now there was one leaning on Jesus' bosom, uh, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of, uh, of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. Now is that really, is that a cryptic answer? Is that Jesus being tricky? That's a pretty clear answer. I mean, it'd be like if we were sitting around the table and I said, hey, one of these guys in here is a Judas. And you said, hey, who is it? It's like, hey, it's he who I spread, the, I'm going to spread some butter on a piece of bread and I'm going to hand it to him. Would you go, I wonder what that means. <laughs> Man, that's deep, you know? Wow, that's profound. Like, how, would you have a hard time following what I just said to you? No. And that's what Jesus is saying. Hey, look, I'm going to dip the sop in the bread, and then I'm going to give it to him, and that's who it is. I mean, you couldn't be more clear. I mean, might as well just, like, set off a flare gun that, had it, that just burst, and it had, it said, like, a giant arrow that said, it's Judas, and, like, you know, doing this, you know? The, the only way he could have been more clear is just to stood up and said, Judas is the betrayer, yeah. right? But he's, he's, he's doing this in this manner for a reason, I believe. And when he dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. <coughs> I mean, they should have been able to put that together, right? Now, do you think anybody after this point has suspected Judas? I don't think they had. You know, they trusted him with the bag. You know, they gave Judas the money, right? And after the, and, and it says when he dipped the sop, verse 27, and after the sop, Satan entered, entered into him. Then Jesus said unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. I mean, he's pretty much just spelling it out for these guys, right? Now, no man knew at the, at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. Well, it's because it was an answer to your question. That's what he was doing. For some of them thought because Judas had the bag, but Jesus said unto him, uh, that Jesus said unto him, buy those things which we have need of against the feast, or you should give something to the poor. So this goes completely over their heads. They do not, they don't figure this out. This isn't like, you know, they, they go, oh, well, let's stop Judas from going and doing that. They, this, they totally miss this. Now, <coughs> what's interesting is that they had to pull this information out of Jesus. Did you notice that? Uh, and this, the way this, this passage reads, it, it's showing us that Jesus had no, it, it seems like he didn't have any intention of revealing it to them. 
He just said, hey, one of you is going to betray me. And he kind of leaves it at that. And then they have to be like, hey, John, ask him. Who is it? You know, the curiosity was, was getting the best of them. They wanted to know. They had to press Jesus for the information. So why is it that Jesus doesn't volunteer this information? Why didn't he just come right out and say it? Hey, Judas is going to betray me. You know, that would have been easy, right? Because Jesus knew they still wouldn't get it. He, even after he, he said, look, I, what's the point in me volunteering it? You're still not going to get it. That is Judas. You know what that, so it's pointless for us to go on a witch hunt looking for Judas's and trying to figure out who it is. Because here's the thing, you, you'll never know who it is. You have to let Judas out himself. Judas has to reveal himself. Now when Judas shows up with, uh, with the Pharisees with, with you know, spears and, 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 and torches in the garden a few hours later in the middle of the night to arrest Jesus, do you think, and comes to Jesus and says, Master, and kisses him to betray him, do you think they had any question then? No, but by then it's too late. They, now it's obvious who the Judas is, right? But at this point, it wasn't. Even though he had pointed him out and said, look, you know, it's Judas. They said, Whoop. So we can't go on this witch hunt looking for people and trying to figure out who a Judas is because we'll never know until Judas outs himself. And then, you know what's going to happen? We're probably going to be very surprised on who the Judas is and who the Judas isn't. You know, I'm sure when they found out Judas, they were like, you know, somebody probably came to Peter and was like, dude, I thought it was you. You know, I, I, had, my, I had my money on you the whole time, Peter. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little relieved, you know, because, you know, I don't know why anyone would suspect Peter. But, you know, I'm just making a joke of it. But, you know, probably be like, really, that guy? I, for, I thought for sure it was going to be this disciple over here. So it's going to take us uh, be by surprise no matter who it is. You know, so let's not bother going on some witch hunt trying to figure out who the Judas is because we can't know. They have to reveal themselves, and, and they will. And you know, you can, that's one thing you can count on about a Jew is, is that they're going to reveal themselves. <coughs> you know, because they, they, they reveal themselves. Why? Because they have a motive to do harm. Eventually it comes out. You know, the backstabber always ends up stabbing the guy in the back. The Judas always ends up being a betrayer. That's their motive. They're going to out themselves eventually. It just takes time. And we just have to let them do it. Now, it's unfortunate, and I understand where a lot of times we come from, from that place where, like, well, we got to figure out who it is, you know, as a, as a type of, you know, we want to stop the Judas before anything bad happens. But, you know, a Judas isn't a Judas until he does what a Judas does. Does that make sense? So we have to let Judas be Judas. And that's just the way it goes. So let's not bother going on these witch hunts. What we need to do, rather, is to just focus on ourselves. Just focus on our own walk. Look here in verse 4 in Deuteronomy chapter 13. <clears throat> you know, God doesn't want people getting caught up with false prophets. He doesn't want them being led away with the error of the wicked. But he, and, he, and he prescribes here a method to do that. He says, look, verse 4, Ye shall walk after the Lord your God, and fear Him, and keep His commandments, and obey His voice, and ye shall serve Him and cleave unto Him. You know, that's what's going to keep you getting from, you know, caught up with the Judases. Is when you get in God's word, you know, and you fear God more than you fear man. You know, you fear God more than you value some relationship with a friend. You know, a lot of times that's what happens with people when some guy goes off the deep end into heresy. Is his buddies go with him just out of, you know, their loyalty to their friend. Well, you know what? You love, you love your friend's false doctrine and, and, you're, and you're letting your, your relationship with some man get out of the... Get, <laughs> you know, uh, be more important to you than the fear of God at that point. And that's why God, this is the remedy here. God's saying, look, fear me, keep my commandments and cleave unto him. You know, and that, then we're not going to get caught up and swept away with these false prophets. You know, we pass the test of the false prophet by focusing on our own walk. If we just stay focused on what we need to be doing in our own lives, serving God, being faithful to the Lord, fearing God, you know, the Judases will come and go but we will remain faithful unto the end. <coughs> so we need to focus more on ourselves rather than others if we're going to pass the test. <coughs> you know, that's how we're going to prove and out these people. And, uh, <coughs> well, let's just go on here in verse 5. He says, And that prophet, or that dreamers of dreams, shall be put to death. Now that's, that's what the Bible says. And I, I don't apologize for that at all. That's what needs to happen to these people according to the Bible. You know, but what's going on today? The dreamer of dreams, right? The, the, the false prophet, 
she'll have a book deal. Right. You know, she'll have a you know hour long special on on every every Sunday afternoon or whatever. Is going to fill stadiums. Is going to be a multi millionaire. Is going to preach lies and heresies with no consequences in this life. That's what's going on today. Because people shy away, because people pull back from that. Now, I'm not saying vigilante justice. I'm not promoting that we, as a body, go out and string up Joel Olstein or something, right? <laughs> you know, that's to be, that this is, uh, we have to understand Deuteronomy is given as the, the, the law of the land. You know, it's the civil government's job to carry this out. Okay. If, they're, if, 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 a, if a government's going to follow righteous law, this is what they're going to do, right? We're not going to do this as a body. And I, anytime you talk about the death penalty in church or bring this up, you have to clarify that because you get all the haters that, oh, you're, you're just trying to start a theocracy. You're, trying to, you're, you're encouraging people to go and, and take up arms and, and commit violent acts. No, I'm not. I'm saying this is what a righteous government would do. This is what a holy and righteous government would do. They would put these people to death according to the word. <coughs> and you say, well, doesn't that seem a little harsh? Well, 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 God gives the reason why here. He doesn't just say that. He tells us why he has such a harsh penalty. Because God doesn't just prescribe the death penalty for, for every little thing. You know, he, there, it's, it's, there's some, just a very few handful of things that God prescribes the death penalty for. And this is one of them. And he gives us the reason why. It goes on there. In verse 5, it says, Because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. And it's not, you know, he, God is jealous. We talked about this earlier. God is jealous for his people. You know, he, if God's the one that turned, brought them out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage and to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God, God commanded thee to walk in, so shall thou put away evil from the midst of thee. So God he takes this matter very seriously because of the fact of everything that he has done for his people. You know, I mean, God's the one that brought them out with a strong arm, you know, with all the, the miracles in Egypt and, and, and destroyed Pharaoh's army and you know, led them through the wilderness all those 40 years, brought them into, the, is bringing them into the land of Canaan, is going to get, you know, drive out the inhabitants before them. God's just doing all these things for them, delivering them, blessing them. So God takes it real serious when somebody else is going to come in and try to, and as it says there, thrust thee out of the way. You know, which is an interesting way to put it. Because you think of a false prophet being someone who's kind of like leading you out of the way, right? But if we start to give ear to a false prophet, we're going to end up as feeling pushed out of the way, thrust out of the way. It's a very, uh, you know... Um, but anyway, he, what he's, he's just, he's, he's jealous. He doesn't want... Uh, so he's not going to share his glory with another. Right. And, and so that's why God takes this so seriously, seriously because it's an offense to him. You know, and how would we feel if, if we were in, those, in, those shoes, in his shoes, in his, in his position? Uh, we, would, we would probably feel much the same way. And what this does, and if you would, turn over to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. It shows us a side of God that a lot of people want to pretend just isn't there anymore. That God is just all love and peace and, and, and flowers and rainbows and puppy dogs and there's no abrasive side to God's nature. There isn't a very abrasive side to God's nature. God is wrath. God is indignation. God is righteous judgment. I mean, God, it says, you know, God is one whose mouth kindled the very fires of hell. I mean, He made hell. He sends people there. That's who God is. So let's not ignore this side of God. You know, we can't, we can't have just this one-sided view of who the Lord is. He's a, he's a multifaceted person. You know, he's a complete being. We have to understand everything about him. And we can't just cherry pick what we do and don't like. And of course, we understand God is love and all that as well. That's another sermon. Right now we're in Deuteronomy 13 where he's talking about putting people to death. So this is what we're talking about tonight. Now he says here, you know, in Proverbs chapter 6, uh, you know, it goes on to show us, I'll read to us in a minute, but what God is showing us is that God hates certain things. God hates certain people. You know, sorry, Joyce Meyer, but, you know, God is, in fact, mad at some people to the point where he says, put them to death. That's Bible. And, and God hates certain people and God hates certain behaviors that people do. Look here in, in Proverbs 6, verse 16. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination unto him. So here's, about, here's at least seven things we know for sure, according to the Bible, that God hates. Meaning that God hates some things, right? So we're about to read some hate speech tonight in God's house. 
things that God hates. Pro, uh, verse 17, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. I mean, are these not good things to hate? Why would we want to? Why would we want to give hands that be swift to, uh, that that shed innocent blood? Why would you want to not hate that? Right. Be like, oh, don't pick on them. I know they shed innocent blood, but give them a break. You know, God says He hates it. And heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. God hates these things. You know, and a lot of these things should never be, would not, probably never be found in us, but let's make sure none of these things are ever found in God's people. You know, I'm sure there's nobody in, in this house tonight that's going to be quick to shed innocent blood. <laughs> Everybody can relax a little bit. You know. There's not going to be any murders tonight. You know, but there is a temptation sometimes to sow discord. That's one that happens. This kind of thing can creep in. You know, and we've seen this even recently, you know, in our, in our movement or whatever you want to call it, you know, with these, these pastors that have turned on our pastor and are stabbing him in the back. And if you're not on social media, you probably don't know even know what I'm talking about, so I'm not going to go on and on about it. But these people that are constantly attaching themselves to our pastor because of the influence he has online, you know, and he has listeners, and then they, and then they attach themselves to him, and they get a following, and people start coming to their church, and then, you know, it turns out that, you know, they've been talking smack about him. They've been sowing discord among the brethren about him. And they've been speaking lies, quite frankly, about him. And I'll tell you what, God hates it. God's not pleased with that. <clears throat> and here's the thing. False prophets are often guilty of all, if not many, of these behaviors. You know, now I'm not saying these guys that did this, these guys are, are, are all false prophets. I have some strong suspicions about one, but, you know, like I just said, I could be wrong, right? But these guys, you know, uh, I'm just false prophets in general. Ones that you know, hey, these guys are false prophets. You know, oftentimes they're guilty of all these things, if not many of them. I mean, many of them, if not all of them. <coughs> but we'll move on here. So, you know, why is God so harsh about this? Why is God saying, look, put him to death. Don't spare. Because God hates them, for one, and because of the fact that it's they're not just speaking lies and to no, with no consequences. It's not just that God is jealous, you know, uh, or something of of the fact that they're getting some floor time with His people. You know, it's because people do get turned aside, because that does have consequences. And look, if we end up getting turned aside by some false prophet, we're the ones that are going to suffer the consequences. We're the ones that are going to have to deal with the repercussions. You know, whether it be in our lives or the lives of our children, you know, um, that's why it matters. And that's why it, 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 you know, it should matter who it is to us. I mean, look here in verse six. You think this was harsh, you know, God, God gets even harsher. <laughs> you know, he says in verse six, if thy brother, the son of thy mother or thy son or thy daughter. Now thy son, you know, I could kind of, no, I'm just kidding, but thy daughter, <laughs> Or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which as thy, is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly. Look, he's saying, I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's the, well, I don't care what relationship it is. I don't care how close they are, are to you. I don't care how near and dear these people are to you. If it's your son, your brother, your sister, your wife, your friend, your best buddy, it doesn't matter. If they entice you secretly, and they and they and they to serve other gods which thou hast now thou, not known thou nor thy fathers, namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, nine of thee or far off from thee, from one end of the earth even unto the other at the end of the earth, thou shalt not consent unto them nor hearken unto them, neither shall thine eye pity them. He's saying, look, you need to put your emotion aside, you need to put your feelings aside for these people. <clears throat> neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him. Don't say, hey, shh, don't talk about that. You know, don't put him in the cellar and be like, shh. You know, don't, you know. If it gets found out, don't conceal him. Right. She's like, yeah, they're right here. Here they are. Do what you will. You know, don't spare these people. He's saying, like, this is all Bible. <clears throat> and he says here in verse 9, thou, but thou shalt surely kill him. I mean, this, this is uh, what God thinks of it. And not only that, he says, thine hand shall be first upon him. He's saying, look, if, the, if one of these people, even if it's a dear relationship like this, 
turns out to be some wicked false prophet who's going to teach lies and damnable heresies with the intent of bringing harm upon God's people and lead others astray after false gods. You know, because of the severe consequences that come with that, no matter who it is, you should be the first one to take them to the proper authorities. Thine hand shall be first upon him and take him before the judges, right? And, and, and carry out the sentence. <clears throat> but thou shalt surely can't kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death. And afterwards, the hands of all the people. Now, that's interesting. It says, not only will you not conceal him, and not only will this person be killed, but the person who discovers them will be the first person to kill them. They'll be the ones to first, they're going to cast the first stone, as it were, because he says, stone them with stones, right? That's the punishment. And he's saying, look, the guy that finds them out, they're the ones that have to start everything. You know what that does? It keeps people from just throwing out false accusations. If you know that you're going to be the one that is going to have to put the noose around their neck, you're probably not just going to go turning in everybody. You know, just making false accusations and say, oh yeah, it's a, it's a serious and grave matter. You know, I mean, it's really easy this day and age to just call CPS randomly and just say, hey, so-and-so is, you know, doing this and that. And you should probably go and then just place an anonymous call. God doesn't believe in these anonymous tips. God says, you're going to be the one that doesn't, you're going to have to be the one that brings it to light. And not only that, you're going to be the one that carries out the judgment, the execution. Because it's a lot harder to do that, you know. It's a lot harder to just make up lies and false accusations if you know you're the one that has to do that. And I think that's why God wants it that way. Because, you know, it is a double-edged sword, isn't it? You know, this, this, de this issue of the death penalty. Unfortunately, you know, in the way man does things, innocent people do get put to death. You know, should we, I mean, that's unfortunate. That's, an un that's unfortunate. That's very bad. And that's why God says here, you know, that we need to be making, you know, or doing our due diligence. We need to make diligent inquiry. And the person that levies the accusation has to be the one who actually pulls the trigger, so to speak. That would take care of a lot of it, wouldn't it? And the fact, you know, if we, we won't study it out right now, but the fact that if you bring a false witness against somebody and it's found out you're lying, you get the punishment that they would have. <laughs> that takes care of a lot of it. You know, if I, I'm not going to be so quick to, you know, tr accuse somebody of something that's worthy of death if I know there's a chance it might come back on my own head. So that takes care, you know, God puts all these things in place to try to minimize, you know, uh, bad judgment. You know, and, and of course God gives discernment and things like that. But really what God is showing us here, you know, I believe that's part of why God wants, you know, us to be the first to do it. But also I think he's also trying to get us to consider something. Who do you love more? Okay, and I, now I don't want people to misconstrue this as you shouldn't love these people, these relationships in your life. You know, we should love our brothers and our sisters and our wives and our daughters and our sons and all that. You know, that should be there. It's not a question of not loving somebody, you know, loving somebody at the expense of another but who do you love more you know are you going to love are, are you going to let your affection and your your memories and your nostalgia for some relationship in your life you know supersede your love for god even if that person's wicked you shouldn't i mean that's that's the message of the bible jesus said he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me now he didn't say he that loveth father or mother is is not worthy of me he said, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth me is not worthy of me. So, you know, who do I love more? Do I love my wife more or do I love the Lord more? Well, I love the Lord more. Amen. You know, the best way I've ever heard it is, you know, why do you say that? Because I can't be the husband I need to be for my wife if I don't love God more than her. Me loving God more than my wife or children is the most loving thing I could do for them. Does that make sense? If I say, hey, I'm going to let this book, you know, the Word of God, I'm going I'm to love this more than any other relationship in my life, you know, that's going to benefit every other relationship in my life because that's going to make me the husband I need to be. You know, that's going to make us the spouses we need to be. That's going to make us, you know, everything we need to be in every relationship that we have. And that's why we need to love God more than any other relationship. He says here in verse 12, we'll, we'll go on, he says, If thou shalt hear, say in one of thy cities, which the Lord thy God hath given thee to dwell, dwell there, saying, Certain men, the children of Belial are gone out from among you, 
and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which ye have not known. Now, he's kind of transitioning a little bit, right? But let me just stop here real quick and let's just define what is the children of Belial. Most of us are probably familiar with this, but Beal, Belial is just another word for the devil. You know, Belial, another word, you, you know, Baal is another one, Beelzebub, right? And he's saying, look, if, the, if certain men, the children of Belial, what is he saying? Children of the devil, okay? Now, not every, but every unsaved person is a child of the devil. Some people have this mistaken notion that if you're not saved, you're, a chi you're automatically a child of the devil. And that's not the case. And that's, that's a whole other thing to, we, have to, we would have to unwrap tonight. And we really don't have a lot of time. But look, the, ch the children of the... Just because somebody is, is unsaved doesn't mean they're automatically you know, a son of Belial. Yeah, right. okay, so we need to keep that in mind. Children of Belial are reprobates. People who have been given over to a reprobate mind. That's what they are. You know, a great example of this is I'll read to you from uh, Samuel chapter 2. If we recall, Hophni and Phinehas, right, which were the priests, the sons of Eli in the tabernacle. And they were, they were stealing from the offering. They were, they were uh, you know, doing all the things false prophets love to do. They fleece the flock. You know, they, they, they cause people to despise the offering of the Lord by, you know, taking the best for themselves. They, if you recall, they were taken by force unsodden flesh from the people and they were taking the fat which was supposed to be burned and they were eating it for themselves and they were you know fornicating with the women which came uh, to the door of the temple so they're basically just you know at at the temple just you know cruising for these illicit relationships um, wicked people you know doing this in the house of god that's not your average sinner <laughs> that's not just some guy who's got you know a drinking problem or something or, you know, he takes the Lord's name in vain when, he's, when he hits his hand with a hammer or something. That this isn't just your run-of-the-mill sinner. This is wicked people who could be so brazen and so brash to go into God's house and just, you know, do these wicked sins. That's a special kind of wicked. And it says there, in, in, in talking about uh, uh, the sons of Eli, it says in Samuel chapter uh, 2, it says... Uh, uh, sons of Eli uh, were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. So to be a son of Belial, you know, you have to be doing these actions that they were doing. You have to be you know, somebody who is capable of these kinds of sins and you don't know the Lord. And uh, <clears throat> that's what we're, God is beginning to address here. Look, if you're, how are you going to handle the reprobates? How are you going to handle these sons of Belial in your, in your community? Okay? And, uh, news, and you know, let me just... You break it to you. You're not going to give them a pride parade. Yeah, right. You're not going to block off the city street and let them march up and down and display their filth to the world. Right. You're not going to promote their philosophy to <laughs> kindergartners. You're not going to let their, their crude and lewd books be published and, and given to children in, in junior highs, <coughs> high school, and, and promote this filthy, wicked, ungodly lifestyle. Right. That's not God's prescription for how to deal with these people. We're about to read it. He goes, verse 14, Then the, uh, shalt thou inquire and make search and ask diligently, and behold, if it be truth and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought among you, thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword. So again, what, what is God prescribing here? Death. The death penalty. That's how God deals with it. You know, you know t somebody write the advocate. <laughs> that wicked publication. You know, and tell them to, whatever, I'm going to go off. But he's saying, look, this is how you deal with it. You kill them. And he says in verse 16, And thou shalt gather all the spoil into the midst. Uh, well, let me pick it back up in verse 15, just in case we didn't get it the first time. Thou shalt surely smite the, with the inhabitants of the city with the edge of the sword, destroying it utterly, and all that is therein, and the cattle thereof with the edge of the sword. He said, don't even take the animals. You know, he doesn't even want, he doesn't want anything. In God's eyes, it's all tainted. It's all polluted. And he says in verse 16, And thou shalt gather all the spoil of it into the midst of the street thereof, and shall burn the city with fire. Uh, burn with fire the city, excuse me. So he says, not only are you going to kill everybody and every, every, all the cattle, then take everything that they have and take it to the, end, in the middle of the city and burn it. Mm -hmm. This is extreme. <laughs> right? I mean, this is, this, is on the, this is on the more harsher end of God's punishment. God doesn't do this to just everybody. You know, this isn't just, you know, 
you know, little Billy got caught st stealing a cookie out of the cookie jar. And it's like, well, sorry, bud. You know, it's fire and brimstone for you. You know, bring everything out of your bedroom, pile it up here out in the yard. <laughs> Grab a pile of rocks, kids. That's not what, you know what I mean? God doesn't just roll the, that's, that, that's the stupidity of people who say, well, all sin's equal. Yeah, right. Not in God's eyes. Well, then why does God punish all sin equally? Why does God have such severe punishments for certain sins and not others if all sin is equal? That's, that's a stupid statement. <clears throat> it's because it's not equal. And God's saying, look, you're going to kill them and then you're going to burn everything that they have with fire. Because God's trying to make an example out of them. Because God wants us to get, the idea, get it through our heads what he thinks of these people. And his mind hasn't changed. Go read Jude tonight. God says that those people are put forth an example suffering the eternal, a vengeance of eternal uh, hellfire. That, that's the example we're looking for. You go to Jude and you say, what does God think about homosexuality today? He points back to Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, that's what I think. Well, why don't we have a New Testament example? Why does he have to point to the Old Testament example? Because God hasn't changed. Because God had made up his mind back then and he hasn't changed in the New Testament. <coughs> you know, and we have an example of this in Scripture. If you would, turn over to Judges chapter 19. This very story plays out. If you recall, Judges 19... You know, the man is traveling with his, uh, his concubine. They're trying to find a place to sleep. And he, he goes aside into uh, this, this man's house, brings him in and out of the street. And, uh, and it says in verse 22, we'll pick it up there. Now as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial. So there's that term again, right? We just read that. Beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house that we may know him. Now, he's not, they're not saying they want to, you know, ask him what his favorite color is. You know, when they say to me that we may know him. They don't want, they're not trying to get to know him like that. He's talking about having a carnal, physical relationship with them. You know, raping him, basically, is what they're talking about. You know, filthy, wicked thing. And it says, and, and, <coughs> and the man, verse 23 the master of the house went to them and said to them, Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly, saying this man is coming to, seeing this man is coming to my house, do not this folly. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. I will bring them out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man, do not so vile a thing. But the men would not hearken to him. So the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them, and they knew her. And abused her all the night until the morning. And, and, w and when the day spring, uh, began to spring, they let her go. So, you know, there's a few things we can learn thus far is that, you know, these reprobates, you know, don't think they don't go both ways because they do. Yeah. You know, they'll, anything that has, you know, God, you know, I'm trying to keep it as, as tame as I can here, you know, but here's the thing. The, the God uh, makes it real clear, you know, in Leviticus, <laughs> we, we read about, the Sodomites, and then you read about the people that are into beasts right after that. Right. The bestiality as well. So these people, this is what they're like. Anything that moves is good enough for them. <coughs> and, and so they bring out, the, he brings out the concubine. And then of course when the day comes up, they let her go. Verse 29, we'll pick it up there. Uh, if you recall the story, she, she makes it back there and gets to the threshold. And the guy just gets up and says, come, let us be going. You know, such a tender-hearted individual. And, uh, you know, of course, she, but she doesn't move, so he throws her on, on, the, on his animal. They go, and she's dead. So she, these guys literally killed her through what they did to her. In verse 29, it says, and when, they were coming, and when he was coming to his house, he took a knife and lay hold on his concubine and divided her. So he quarters her. You know, he takes off an arm, another arm, a couple of legs. You know, he, he cuts her up is what it's talking about. You know, uh, you say the Bible's a boring book. Well, hey, <laughs> that's a pretty interesting story. Yeah. <laughs> now, God's just saying this is what happened. God's not saying this is how he wants things done. Yeah. You, didn't see that, you didn't read that in Deuteronomy where God says, hey, this happens. If you suspect this is sons of Belial, you need to cut somebody up. Right. That's not what he says. But this guy's doing this because he's trying to draw attention to the fact that this city has sons of Belial in it. This, this city in the, in the tribe of Benjamin has these wicked, wicked reprobate sons of the devil living in there and thriving to the point where, the, where they can just take go to a house and just demand that they give over some strangers and they can do whatever they want to them. And then they, and they can do it. And then instead they get a concubine and they do whatever they want to her 
and they're just and because they think they're just going to get away with it. And there are no consequences. That's how wicked it had gotten. So this man does this, you know, very drastic uh, deed here. Goes to these, these these drastic ends to make sure it's known. So he cuts her up, <coughs> and he took a knife. It says in verse twenty nine, and lay hold of his concubine and divided her well, together with her bones into twelve pieces, and sent her into all the coasts of Israel. You know, so he sends this body out, and people are, you know. You know, I don't know where exactly it went, but you know, these people are bringing body parts and saying, "Hey, it's from this concubine." And it was so that all that saw it uh, said there was uh, there was no such deed, deed done nor seen from the day of the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt unto this day. Consider it. <coughs> Excuse me. Take advice and speak your minds. And what happens as a result? Well, Israel, as a result, of course, unites, comes together against Gibeah, where the city was or that's the name of the city, and they destroy it. We know the story, right? They come up against it, they acquire of God, they go against it, and they, and they destroy it. And if, if you recall, they actually end up burning it with fire, just like God told them to do in Deuteronomy. Now here's the thing. You say, well, that's harsh. This is real harsh chapter night. Stone this false prophet. Stone the son of Belial. Uh, why is this guy cut, cutting up his concubine and and, and why are they destroying this entire city and burning it with fire? Why are they doing this? This seems kind of harsh. Well, if you consider that harsh, you need to stop and, and you, you fail to consider the suffering of the concubine. You fail to consider the suffering of the innocent that are being preyed upon by people like this. And that's what people need to do in this country today. Instead of getting this soft spot for all these sodomites <clears throat> and letting the television brainwash them into thinking that there's something they're not. You know, they're in every, go, go look up these people in every Bible story there is and see what kind of people they are. Predators every time. Rapists. They're the worst people there are. That's the only picture the Bible paints about them. And that's the only one I need to see. And if we're going to start getting the soft spot, you know what you're doing? You're, 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 you're downplaying the suffering that they inflict on other people. Yep. You know, we talked about it in that sermon a few weeks ago about you know, what needs to happen to perverts in this country. And these molesters, they need to be dealt with, you know, harshly. And uh, you, you say, well, let's rehabilitate them, you know, or let's give them a background check. You're, it's too late for the person whose life they've already destroyed. Yep. You know, there's got to be justice. <coughs> let's move on here. It says in verse 17 in Deuteronomy chapter 13, and there, shall, uh, and there shall cleave not of the cursed thing to thine hand, uh, that the Lord may turn from the fierceness of his anger and show thee mercy and have compassion upon thee and multiply thee as, as he has sworn unto thy fathers. When thou shalt hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and keep all his commandments which I command thee this day to do that which is right in the eyes of the Lord thy God. So here's the thing, you know, God wants to forgive these people. He w not those people, that not the sons of Belial. But God doesn't want to have to judge the entire nation because of them. You know, if a nation just steps back and says, you know, if, if, if Israel, when they, when they all got their body part, it just said, ah, eh, you know, it's, it's just a concubine anyway. I mean, is it that big a deal? I mean, it's Benjamin, you know, it's our brethren. I know they're into that over there, but it's just their lifestyle. You know, it's just, it's just they, they just want to love one another. That's just how they are, you know. They can't help it. They were born that way. Do you think God would just not done anything about it? You know, God would have started just pouring, <coughs> pouring out his wrath on that whole nation. Yeah, right. Now, how do you know that, Brother Corbin? Because that's exactly what he did later when they went after false gods, when they stopped carrying out God's righteous judgment. Yep. And God had them all carried away into Babylon, had their cities destroyed. You know, Assyria came, uh, the Chaldeans came and just destroyed them. You know, that's, and it happened to the whole nation because, you know, they don't want to deal with this. And that's where we're at in this country. And again, I'm not saying that we as individuals, you and I, should go do something about it. I'm going to get up and preach about it. You know, and you should do with it what you will as far as how you're going to instruct, you know, your own, lead your own home and teach your own children and help them to understand right from wrong in this matter. But, you know, if, our, if we wanted to spare ourselves some, some wrath from God, we would deal with these people like this. Our civil authorities would do exactly what God says with these people. Stone them with stones, burn everything they have, make an example out of them. And that's Bible tonight. You know? 
We were just talking about this the other week, you know, because I had to end this chapter short. And it's like, you know, hey, we, uh, you know, the, I like preaching, ver you know, we, we say we're preaching verse by verse. We're really preaching chapter by chapter. You know, you say, well, you should preach verse by verse in case you, you know, you don't want to preach anything. I think I've proven tonight I'm not holding back anything on <laughs> the Word of God. You know, it would have been real easy. You know, in a lot of churches, they would have just gone right by chapter 13. You know, let's go find something else tonight to pre talk about. That's, that's a little harsh. You know, it's going to give the kids nightmares or something. You know? But that's what's in the Bible. That's what I'm here to preach. That's what I have to do. That's my job as a preacher. And I'm not ashamed of it. I don't say that gr grudgingly, you know. Uh, I'm glad to preach the whole word of God. And, you know, God wants to show mercy and God wants to have compassion. And that's what I want for this country. I want God to spare his wrath. And to not destroy this country. But guess what? Someone's got to get up and say, hey, this is what God thinks of this stuff. And we're treating these people completely wrong. You know, giving them their, their, their time in the sun is, is not the answer. You know, giving them primetime television spots. You know, sorry, Anderson Cooper. Go jump in a lake of fire, buddy. That's what I say to that guy. Sodomite. You know, they're being lifted up in the media, lifted up in entertainment. Lifted up in our public school systems, exalted, praised. That's what's going on in our country. It's nowhere near what, what God prescribes. It's not even close. So do you expect God to show us mercy when we need it? To forgive this country for all the innocent blood it's shed? For all the wicked things it's been doing for decades now? Because God says, look, if you'll do all this, you know, he's that he may turn away the fierceness of his anger. It's not just that God's going to hold back his blessing. It's that he's going to get proactive and show his anger towards people that refuse to deal with this, that allow this kind of thing to go on in their midst. Because <coughs> here's the thing, you know, God is love, God is mercy, God is, but you know what else God is? Is justice. And God is, it has a just nature. And, and God's ways are higher than our ways. If we, if we don't agree with this tonight, you know, we get, need to get our hearts right. Maybe we should spend a little bit more time in the book than, you know, letting some movie or Hollywood tell us what to think about these things. <laughs> because, you know, justice must and shall be served. It's going to be served. God, they're going to get what's coming to them one day, sooner or later. Either by the hand of man or by the hand of God. The question, you know, we as a nation need to ask ourselves tonight is, do we want to go down with them? Because that's, that's the option. You know, it's, not, it's not that God's just going to turn a blind eye. God will just take us all down with them. <coughs> so, here's, you know, what's, what, what's God showing us here tonight in Deuteronomy chapter 3? Is that you know, truly compassionate leadership that really cares about its people you know, is going to execute God's judgment according to His Word so that it will spare other people around them from having to suffer the consequences of not doing so. Let's go ahead and pray.